Guys, I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. If you didn't draw a hunt this year, don't worry. There are still ways to get a tag and get out in the field. Not only are there leftover and OTC opportunities, but if you join GoHunt.com Insider with promo code JSCOTT by August 31st, 2021, you're also going to be entered to win $1,500 worth of Kuyu gear. You also are going to get 10 entries into GoHunt's big summer of elk giveaway where you could win a 2022 New Mexico elk hunt and $15,000 in hunting gear. Go Hunt Insider is the one platform for finding great hunts, researching new units, e-scouting, and planning your hunt. Now, an added incredible value at no extra cost are desktop maps and maps available on iPhone and Android. Again, this is no extra cost. It's part of being an Insider member. Don't miss out on this incredible opportunity. Sign up at GoHunt.com forward slash Scott and get a $50 Go Hunt Gear Shop gift card just by using the J. Scott promo code. And also, don't forget, you're going to be entered into a drawing to win $1,500 worth of Kuyu gear. I also want to thank the gear shop at GoHunt.com and Cody Nelson, my friend of 20 plus years, the glassing guru. Don't forget, if you order on GoHunt.com or you call or text Cody at 602-399-3699, you're going to get a 10% discount by using the J. Scott promo code. You can also call the shop directly at 702-847-8747 or email at optics at gohunt.com. I want to thank GoHunt for their sponsorship of this podcast. I also want to thank Kuyu Ultralight Hunting for sponsoring this podcast. That is the gear that I wear on all of my hunts. You can go to kuiu.com to order directly off the website. They're a direct-to-consumer company. They make the best hunting gear on the market today. Also, phonescope.com. Use the jscott21 promo code. You're going to get a 10% off on all orders at phonescope.com. Guys, thanks for listening, and let's get right to this episode. Guys, welcome to the J. Scott Outdoors podcast. Today, I've got my good friend Steve Chappell of Chapel Guide Service and Zero Hunt Fees. Steve, how you doing? I'm doing excellent, Jay. It's great to be on with you. And man, uh, summer is uh, about to end here and, and September is coming quick. Yeah, I mean, we're uh, 45 days away or so of hearing an elk bugle, so I'm starting to get excited. Uh, Steve, uh, I know you just got back from Arizona and uh, going and checking conditions. I think the forest just opened um, what did you find down there? What did you see? Um, give us kind of your on the ground take of, of what's happening. Yeah, Jay, mine, you know, my take on it's going to be limited to unit nine because that's where I was at. And to be honest with you, it, it's gotten better since I left there. Um, it was very bleak when I was there. I mean, super, super dry. Uh, no ponds with water. Uh, I could not see any real green grass, a tiny bit in the pines, but just virtually none. Um, I was seeing some elk with rib cages showing. Um, so it just, yeah, it wasn't looking good. But uh, after I got home within the, you know, last few days, uh, the monsoons have cranked up there. Uh, matter of fact, I think the day I was leaving Unit 9 is when that big flood uh, hit Flagstaff. And um, I, I'm sure it drenched units like 6A and 7 East and probably 6B and 8, you know, 5B North, some of those units. Um, I'm sure uh, we've been getting hit all across the state with this widespread monsoon moisture. So, you know, as bad as I felt after my scouting trip, I'm feeling more encouraged now. Um, I think uh, guys who have archery or early rifle tags, maybe there's a there's some light at the end of the tunnel now for us. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember talking to you or at least getting a text uh, from you and, you know, it was almost like you'd been kicked in the teeth, uh, you know, yeah. going down there. You knew it was going to be rough, but I'm sitting here looking at Tuzion, which is, you know, right there in Unit 9 in the, the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Um, Tuesday, 60 percent. Thursday, 40 percent. Friday, 40. Saturday is 40 you know, 40, 50% chance over the next five, six days there on top of the storm they already got. Um, for the people out there listening that 
are either in unit nine or surrounding units or similar units um, that have been doing scouting and, and maybe notice the same thing that there's maybe pockets that are that are greened up and then lots of areas that are very, very dry. What would be your strategy? You know, now most of the tanks might have water. How does that change anything, any strategy that you would have, you know, with your thought process going into the season as to maybe where you were going to hunt um, or maybe just how you're going to approach it? Yeah, Jay, every year I kind of have guys um, with tags. They'll ask me, you know, for any general ideas on maybe where to hunt. And, you know, I'm not lying when I tell them that I've hunted year to year different places. And it's because I kind of try to follow the moisture because I feel like the elk are going to be healthier where there's green up. There's going to be more cows there, thus more bulls, a uh, more active rut. So I am you know, every day I'm watching the radar. I've got a radar app on my phone that I watch very closely. And uh, I actually do screenshots of it. When I see yellow and red on the radar, I'll take a screenshot of it. And then I'll go and look at my mapping app. You know, in Arizona, I use Flatline. And I, I take a look at that and try to compare uh, that screenshot of the radar to, uh, you know, tanks and areas on, on my mapping. And, uh, you know, make a mental note of that and, of course, record it. Um, so yeah, I'm looking to hunt areas that get more moisture for sure. Um, because, you know, as you know, these monsoons can kind of be hit or miss and spotty in a unit. Um, but again, I'm, I'm very much encouraged. Um, you know, the antler growth, I won't say it's not a phenomenal year, but it's not bad either considering, um, really. So your, your yeah. cameras and stuff, when you're looking at the photos, it's not too bad. Not bad. I mean, there's. There's quite a few bulls that look fairly unaffected, and their even their bodies looked pretty decent. But in certain parts of the unit, um, you know, the bulls looked really, uh, really skinny. Um, you know, really droughty. Um, not necessarily so much in their antlers, but you could still see that they had quite a bit of uh, tipping out to do. And I don't know how well that will go for those bulls that look stressed. Um, so I'm hoping this green up comes soon and, and they can get healthy. In your opinion, do you think uh, the timing of the storm, say it was around the 15th, 16th of July, I mean, that gives those cow elk 45 days to, you know, to get on green feed and to get, you know, fleshy and, and feeling better. I mean, in my mind, it's almost like it came at a perfect time. Yeah, we'd have loved to have it two weeks earlier and we would have loved to have more of it, but I mean, that does give them time to increase their body condition and potentially get them feeling good and, and go ahead and, you know, have their estrus cycle and go ahead and, and want to be bred. Would you agree? I totally agree with that, Jay. Yeah, I'm so encouraged by the timing of this. It just reminds me kind of of the things as far as hunting that we're totally out of control uh, with, and that's moisture, and God is in control of that, and I'm just so glad we got blessed with that. I know earlier in the year we were hearing about having a wetter than normal monsoon. Um, I'm always a little bit of a skeptic when I hear that because it seems like it's hard for them to predict weather even for a week out, let alone <laughs> months away. But it seems to kind of be the case, uh, and, and it's happening. So, so yeah, I really feel like these elk, uh, the cows especially, do have time to with this what we're going to have a, a green up they'll have time to get healthy and, and have a normal estrus cycle and i always say i would t take a little less on the antlers and a lot more on the bugling to where we can call them and have fun and they're bugling and makes for an active hunt that that's what i'm all about so i'm hoping it's going to be that kind of year yeah and we're going to get into some of that today we've got a bunch of instagram follower uh questions that have a bunch of questions for you but specifically, I want to ask you in some of these arid units, and I think it would apply to unit, uh, you know, units in New Mexico, units in southern Utah, Nevada, other units, specifically when you're before the season, when you're pulling into a unit, what exactly are you looking for? Are you like driving country and just literally looking for your eye to pop? You know, what, what are you looking for specifically to say, I'll bet you there's an elk here? Yeah, um, it, it kind of is the eye popping thing, Jay. Um, you know, I'm going to drive around on the major frontage roads and just look like, like I alluded to earlier for green up and, uh, and water. And then, of course, elk sign, um, you know, adjacent to, to, to water and, and feed. 
Um, I'm also, if I'm an archery hunter, I'm going to be looking for country that, that I feel is conducive to archery hunting, um, which means it's going to be a little bit more on the thicker side uh, to where I can get in tight and call and not get picked by, by cows. That's the toughest part, uh, hunting herd bulls is, you know, that they've got cows around and protecting them, watching out for them. And if you're hunting pine country with a bow, it can be very challenging. I've done it quite a bit, uh, guiding, um, but it's very challenging because those cows can sure pick you out. So yeah, I'm looking for that, you know, kind of cover and terrain, uh, where I can get in and mix it up with them. Yeah, I mean, you and I have been together in certain circumstances where, you know, some of the country in, in Arizona where we've got our ponderosa pine forest, where the Forest Service actually has done a pretty good job of getting in there and thinning out that country. The elk really seem to, you know, take unit nine, for example, um, even seven west, you know, some of those units around Flagstaff. Um, they've done a really good job of kind of thinning out that that underbrush, if you will, but the elk really like it, but the challenge as a hunter, um, Steve, is, as you know, like you can only get probably three or 400 yards away and then they can see that far. Um, yeah. Talk about why that is a challenge for you as uh, someone that, that is really uh, into calling and working elk. When they can see that far away, why does that create a problem? Yeah, because I feel like to get into the zone where it really matters with your calling, that general generally for me happens inside of 150 yards and sometimes closer than 100 yards, just depending on the scenario, but definitely inside of 150. And if you have elk picking you at 300, 400 yards away, or even looking out there and seeing something that they're a little unsure about, they don't know for sure if it's bad, but they're a little unsure about it, the last thing that they're going to do if they hear a call coming from that direction is go, oh, that's where I saw that yeah. uh, movement or whatnot coming from. I'm going to go check out that call. That's the last thing on their mind. They're, they always assume the worst rather than assuming the best out of a scenario. So, um, yeah, it just makes it difficult in that wide open country uh, to get into that that magic zone of, hundred, say, 150 yards or less. Uh, you know, sometimes you can kind of dog the herd, you know, just kind of follow along at a distance without uh, calling or anything, not drawing any attention to yourself and wait for them to get into a little thicker country. You know, typically if they're in that more open stuff, as the morning wears on, they're going to move into thicker stuff to bed. And if you play your cards right and, you know, don't alert them to your presence, many times you can move in with them as it thickens up a little bit and then, and then play your game right there. Steve, I want to ask you about um, Elk Camp TV. I know you're now, I believe, a couple of weeks into the new season. Um, how is it going? And let the listeners know how they can watch that show because it's, it's really good. Not only is it good hunting, but there's some good educational stuff in there as well. Oh, thanks, Jay. Yeah, um, it's hard to believe we're in season four and it's airing on Sportsman Channel. Um, the best time for people to, to catch it is a uh, Monday evening. So it would air at 6 p.m. Mountain time um, for Arizona residents. That would be five o'clock um, for them. And then also on Pacific time would be 5 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern time. Um, yeah, I'm just in the middle of still editing episodes for the season. I've got a couple of more still still going, trying to finish one up uh, right now as we speak. Um but it's very exciting. I'm really, really looking forward to this year and hopefully having a little better hunts and opportunities this fall than we did last year because it was pretty tough. Um, but the feedback on the show, yeah, has, has been fantastic. Um, like you say, I like the show to be entertaining, you know, to entertain people when they watch it, but then also um, to be, you know, somewhat educational without going too overboard that way. Um, I always tell new hunters, that's how I learned to elk hunt was by watching people and learning from them, you know, taking things from each person that I watched. And I think it's a great opportunity for people to, you know, learn more. I, I always learn every year I go out the minute I think I'm, I've arrived the elk school me. So, uh, <laughs> they you know, elk, to do that. <laughs> all, all about that process, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking about feedback on the show, um, how much does it mean to you to get feedback on your show? Oh, yeah, Jay, I absolutely love it. Um, you know, people uh, send me encouraging messages, and, yeah, it's just very uplifting. 
Uh, you know, some people just say something as simple as I love the show. Uh, that, that means a lot to me. Some people mention, uh, you know, my Christian testimony on there. That means a ton to me. Um, you know, cause I couldn't do any of this without the blessing of God. And, you know, I want his grace to be present in every aspect of my life, not just my salvation, but also in my work. So, um, yeah, it just, it just really means a lot to me when I hear from the viewers for sure. Yeah, that's awesome. That's always, it's always great to get good feedback. Um, I'm looking at your website, chapelguideservice.com, and I'm looking at the zero hunt fees section. I notice here, speaking about how it works, um, talking about you've opened it up to residents and non-residents. If I remember correctly, you originally just had it open to non-residents um, and you know, for applying for elk uh, in Arizona, you've now opened it up to residents. Talk a little bit about that and the strategy that you've used to make that successful. Cause you know, I, I get people messaging me uh, after the season and around application time um, about, you know, they're in your service and they're, you know, they had a great hunt and all that different stuff, but talk about that opening up for residents. Yeah, Jay. Um, you know, it took me a couple of years to decide to do that. I mean, I was a little hesitant about it just because obviously, you know, residents get 90 or 90 plus percent of the tags in the draw. So that's a little bit scary of a business model. Um, but, you know, I decided this was the decision I made. You know, I had some residents reaching out to me and saying, you know, you say on your show that, you know, you offer this for anyone um, who would like to avoid a big guided hunt fee or, you know, anyone on any budget and that should include residents. And you know, that, that kind of started working on me, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and then I just kind of came to the thought of, you know, we can handle this, we can do this. Um, as, as far as residents go, I'm not going to say, I'm not looking for people who want to hunt, you know, say 4B late archery or 6A late rifle or that type of thing. You know, we're limiting a little bit uh, to, to, to more of the better hunts for archery, early rifle and muzzleloader, but still there's a lot of units and a lot of options for people, all weapon types. Um, you know, I think there's about 14 units, same way with the non-residents. Um, yeah, and, and I, I offer this program, Jay, and I, and I work with each individual, and I tailor how, I, how we apply for, for each person according to their goals and desires, not mine. So if someone tells me that they've never killed an elk and that they would be totally happy with a 300-inch 6x6, I'm not going to limit them to just applying for 9, 10, or 23 or units like that, you know? You mean, I'm, the, hard, I'm, you mean the hard-to-draw units? In other it, words, that would be you just taking their money and, and smiling. You are actually letting them apply for some of the units, what I would call more some of the mid-tier units, that give them a chance to actually draw and still have an opportunity to kill a 300-inch bull. Absolutely, yeah. So units like you know 5A, 5B North, 5B South, 4A, units like that. Um, if a guy is not super picky on his desires, um, we can use especially a second choice for that type of unit and it increases their draw odds substantially. So again, yeah, I'm not just taking all of the members and putting them in for two hunts that I want them to be in that are the hardest to draw, um, but I'm giving them opportunity to express what they're looking for, what their goals are, and then tailor an application according to that. So I think that's what separates us. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it wouldn't be fair to take someone that, you know, doesn't have many points or someone that does have points and, you know, jam them all into the two best or three best units in the state because the numbers are going to show that hardly anyone's going to draw those tags. Right. And so it's really kind of doing a disservice to the to your 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 member, right? Right. Yeah. And, 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 you know, on the other hand, if I have a member who's a strict trophy hunter or a guy who has a lot of bonus points, absolutely. I won't shortchange him. If he's telling me he wants to hunt a 350, 360 plus bull, um, you know, whatever his desire is, uh, again, I'm going to help him select hunts that are going to fit that. So he's not disappointed. Um, but yeah, for those people who, who have the desire to come hunt Arizona and, you know, maybe it's not in the budget for a six or $7,000 hunt, or they would just rather avoid paying that all in one year. Um, this program makes total sense because it's just $349 a year. 
Uh, there's no minimum amount of years if they draw the very first year. Yes, their hunt is 349, and they don't have to stay in the program for any amount of years to to pay off their hunt, so to speak. So, so they could be one and done. They could draw the first year, and if they decide, well, I mean, why would they? If they drew in their first year, they'd surely sign up for the second year, but they could if they wanted to. It's not like you yeah. say it's a 10-year minimum guarantee, and that would mean – three thousand four hundred and ninety dollars no you're letting them do 349 for one year yeah absolutely i've had some uh younger members who draw the first year and they absolutely stay in because they say heck you know lightning could strike twice i'm young i've got a lot of hunting years left in me absolutely i'm gonna stay in the program and then i've had some older gentlemen draw who they were the first year in the program and they drew and they said you know what I think I had my last great elk hunt, and I don't know that I have another one left in me, so I'm going to uh, quit while I'm ahead, and that's totally fine. Yeah. Nice. Um, I want to dive into some of the questions here from uh, Instagram, so let's just dive right into it, okay? You got it, Jay. Okay, this comes from Grind Hard Outfitters. Last week of the early archery hunt in Arizona, is it the best time to be in the woods? for me i think so um generally if the archery hunt uh you know runs from you know mid to late september i always say that second week is going to be better I, I especially feel that this year um with that second week being you know say the 17th through the 23rd um the uh the fall equinox this year i believe is on september 22nd um, and it's said that, you know, most of the cows are going to come into estrus somewhere around that equinox, and that's right toward the end of the archery hunt. So, yeah, I think that, you know, somewhere in the 18th to the end of that hunt is going to be the best four or five days of that hunt. So I, I would agree with him completely. On the flip side of that, um, early on, what do you think archers uh, in Arizona on that first week are going to face with with that full moon being September 20th, um, you know, w what are they going to face? Do you think moving, you know, that first week into that moon? Yeah. The, the nice thing is, is yeah, we don't have a big full moon at the start of the hunt, which is good. It's building toward full. Um, so that's good. I, I think, you know, it's going to somewhat be dependent on what our weather conditions are. If it's, you know, super hot, we could have a real slow start to the rut. I always say, too, that these elk kind of have um, the opening weekend hangover, so to speak, when everybody hits the woods and everybody's got helpers out there running around. It just kind of, if the elk are bugling, seems to knock them back for a while. Um, In other words, like before the two, three, four days before the season when you're out scouting, they're blowing up pretty good and, and yeah. running around and chasing, and then all of a sudden all the campers and all the, the, the pressure moves in, and it kind of slows them up, right? Uh, yeah, and that can be disappointing for people. So it's tough for a guy who's only got a few days to hunt. So if someone can get back up there toward the end of the hunt, that's always a great opportunity to do that. Um, but if you're forced to hunt, say, that first week, you might have to go a little little deeper and darker, so to speak, to find them and find them where they're bugling and, you know, maybe even resort to some different tactics like glassing and stalking, you know, that spot and stalk type stuff. Steve, uh around that full moon when they are going to be pretty active at night. Um, so people hear us kind of talking about, yeah, it's during a full moon, you know, it's going to kind of be tough. The flip side of that though, is out there at, you know, between nine o'clock and three in the morning when, I mean, that moon is just full on bright, they're going to be out there in those meadows running around. What advice would you give to people that, you know, are going to be facing that this year as far as, if they don't really know where the elk are, don't you think that's a great time to go figure out where they're at? It is, Jay, and, and, and I've done that some in my hunting for sure. I mean, it definitely will wear a guy out, no doubt. Um, you know, I'm a guy that if I'm doing that, I need to come back and rest a little during the late morning uh, to, to be able to stay up and stay on top of it. But it, that is a very good tactic to be able to go out there. And, you know, I'm going to say in general, I, when I do that, I don't call at all. I know how tempting it is when you go out there and you hear them bugling and you got your calls and it, it just, just, it's so fun to call back at them, but I just don't advise doing that. Um, just quietly move around, you know, mark on your, 
on your uh, mapping app where, where you find these pockets of bugling and then just come back and be there in the morning with the wind and all of that in mind. But yeah, that's absolutely a great tactic when they're not, not bugling well in the mornings or evenings from you. That way you can be right on where elk are at first thing in the morning. You know, maybe, maybe that first 15 minutes is the critical time uh, on the full moon. Yeah. For sure. A question here from E. Stoltzman. Steve, you frequently discuss elk calling techniques. However, when is a good time to be quiet and stalk? Uh, to me, I think there's a couple of scenarios when that, when that comes into play. Number one is when you're dealing with a herd bull. Herd bulls are the toughest to deal with. Um, you know, as you know, Jay, we've talked about this on some former podcasts. I've had kind of a breakthrough with dealing with herd bulls with, you know, blowing that lip ball or bull calling cows bugle. But the scenario has to be right. I have to be close enough to him. He has to be in the right position according to where the cows are at. The terrain and vegetation has to be right. So if all those things aren't right, it typically doesn't work. That's a scenario where you need to, you know, stop calling and use your stocking skills to get in there and, you know, mix in with that herd, infiltrate the herd, so to speak, and get a shot opportunity. I know some of the best bow hunters in the world, um, like Randy Ulmer, Dan Evans, they're not big callers. I think they can call, but they kill some great bulls and, and herd bulls in particular by not calling, by just being stealthy. Um, you know, the other scenario is when the elk just flat aren't bugling at all and, and your calling is just yielding no results at all. I think that's another time when you should, you know, face reality and, you know, try doing some stalking and, and some spot and stock type things. I know I'm pretty stubborn. I always want to find that one elk that will <laughs> play the game and act right. But on some years like last year, it's it's super hard to find that elk. So um yeah your listener there is, is is thinking right on the money that there's a time to call and a time to crawl for sure steve specifically when you're talking about some of these guys that maybe just don't make great elk sounds and they just you know they scare more elk away let's let's talk real fast about actually what you would do let's say that you you know i took your calls away for seven days and you had to literally just get in there and stalk walk through kind of a situation of you know bulls are bugling in the morning what would you actually physically do like what is your mindset and what are you what what are you doing specifically by not calling at all take me through yeah. like a stock or how you would work a scenario in the morning well first off i'd cry if i didn't have my <laughs> For a temper tantrum, Jay. You, um, <laughs> you'd, you'd sit back at camp and pout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You'd not go out. Um, really, though, to me, the biggest thing, whether you're calling or not calling, is the wind. And I, I would take that first and foremost. And gosh, I'm going to say at least nine times out of ten, elk are going to move into the wind when they're moving to bed. That, that's their advantage, is their nose. That's their biggest defense. So I'm going to take that into account and I'm going to try to, you know, obviously you can't slip around and be out right out in front of them. Otherwise, you know, they're going to pick you. Um, but I'm going to try to, you know, get out to the side of them and make ground on them that way. And then, uh, you know, use an opportunity when it thickens up a little bit. And they always seem to, they seem to slow down when they get closer to their bedding area and they're trying to sort out. Sometimes even if they're not vocal, I've, observed what i call uh the famous arizona gray light shutdown that these elk a lot of times when the gray light hits they'll go for 30 minutes or more without making a peep as they're moving toward their bedding area and they flat make tracks as they're doing it so in that scenario i would just uh you know point my use my wind checker and point my nose into the wind and go with them and uh, like I said, when they get close to their bedding area, usually they kind of stall out a little bit. And a lot of times that's when they get vocal because they're trying to sort out who's who and, you know, stay away from my cows. I'm bedding down over here. You better stay away from me. And that's your opportunity then to be able to slip in there, um, you know, and get as close as you can. And a lot of times if you're not calling, you can set up, not give away your location and let that herd bull sort around you know, mill around and make a mistake and walk in front of you. Yeah, for sure. And 
Um, you know, I might add too that if you're not going to be calling, you made a good point that you're not giving away your position. I feel like I've witnessed a lot of hunters and, you know, I've done it myself, give your position away. It creates them looking at you. If you're going to yep. go totally stealthy, I'm going to slip in where I can see them. If they're bugling, I'm going to try and look at them with my binoculars and say, is that a bull I want to go after? If it's not, I'm going to remember that bull's bugle, his chuckle, whatever he's doing. I'm going to check yep. him off the list. I'm going to listen for the next bugle. I'm going to use the wind. I'm going to get in there, look at that bull, say, is this something? And I'm going to try and look at as many bulls in a morning as I can. Once I find one that I want, then I'm going to hone in. And, you know, Steve, we've done this together. Hone in on that bull's bugle. I'm going to be patient and kind of slide around the side using the wind. And just like yep. Steve said, I'm going to work my way to where they go into to where they bed. Um, but, you know, um, Dar... Um, we've seen him many times. He doesn't call very much at all, if, if at any, and right. he does very well, um, you know, stalking and, and getting close to those elk. A lot of times too, if they, if they're bugling and you're moving and you're, they're making enough noise, let them bugle. And it's also a great tactic. If you're not a great caller is let them call back and forth to each other you be moving. If they're kind of quiet, you might have to wait a little bit. They bugle yep. again, then ease up and keep moving. I will say, Steve, and I want your opinion on this. It is very hard to get in behind a group of elk and, and get close. You almost have to take the, the parallel approach and get out to the side of them totally. so that you both have the wind in your nose, but you're out to the side and you're waiting for that opportunity that Steve's talking about when they kind of lag up or slow up before their beds. Would you agree yeah. with following a herd of elk, which everyone does it, they follow yeah. right behind. Yeah, me you included. almost always end up bumping into that one last cow or that spike and you spook the whole group. That's what I was going to say. There's always a spike back there lagging around back there that's not making any noise. He's by himself. He's he, he's not making, you know, much noise at all because he's totally alone. And that's the elk that picks you. And they always run to the herd when you spook them. You know, you can even try to cut them off and they'll run around you and run, run to the herd. So, um, yeah, you got to get around all of them. And, and like we were talking about, being out there parallel is way better than, than lagging behind and trying to keep with them. Yeah, and bumping those stragglers, I call them. Steve, I made a note here when you were talking, you were, um, you brought up the bull calling cows bugle and in other podcasts that we've done, you credit Joel Turner. Um, and, and he right. kind of coined that term bull calling cows. Um, and I, I think even a couple years ago, we had a discussion about it and we were both a little bit suspect. Sounds like you've done a lot more, um, messing with that technique and do you credit joel for kind of figuring out that behavioral pattern um and it, it it looks like in watching elk camp tv you've made that work for several scenarios for successful hunts yeah um yeah first off yeah jay i give t joel total credit for for coming up with that uh, the name of that call and talking about it and bringing it to the forefront because i had never really thought of it that way but it's it's you know what some people would call a lip ball bugle um but it kind of starts with a high pretty note it kind of starts with a high pretty note and then it goes into that lip ball sound um and what i believe it's conveying to those cows is just maturity confidence here i am the new stud on the block come over and check me out you know type thing and it just seems to infuriate a herd bull when you get in there in you know in with his harem and you're in that zone and you blow that call it, it's like they have that attitude are you kidding me you're going to come in here and do that on top of my cows i'm going to come over there and stomp you right and, but wouldn't you agree that call is not to be done at 400 yards that is a oh, call to be done at 100 yards or less absolutely because at 400 yards yeah you may get an aggressive response back maybe two bugles back but pretty quickly you're going to notice that they're that it's going away from you so you got to put him you got to be in that range where you put him in that fight or flight mode and i've learned that if you're inside of 100 yards and and you've got those cows nearby to you 
so that when you blow that call, he thinks, wow, my cows are right there. I could lose my cows to this bull. It seems like nine times out of 10, they're a herd bull for a reason. It's because they're aggressive and they're jealously guarding what they have and protecting that, that harem. I've just found that more often than not, they're going to come over and, and look to kick you out of there. Next question. Uh, is hunting cows much different than hunting bulls? <sighs> I would say many ways it's very similar. Obviously, what we're talking about with calling, with the wind, um, you know, distance, uh, being close, all of that matters with cows. Um, I think a very effective call that many people overlook is a, is a calf call or, you know, like a calf in distress, just kind of a, a high pitched, um, you know, dist distressful calf call. Cows are, uh, you know, very curious, and they're also very defensive also of, of their young. Um, Not only their calf, but I've seen other. Ca all kinds of cows come because they hear a calf in distress, and they, they're coming to protect that calf of, you know, their, yeah. their, fellow, their fellow cow. A absolutely. So I think if a guy can, can listen to calves, listen to elk sounds, but listen to calves specifically, if you're going to be hunting cows or even bulls, I feel like a calf call is always a good go-to call, whether you're hunting cows or bulls. Uh, because many times, and that, that's another thing I've picked up on Joel Turner saying, is that, is that a, a mature cow who's the leader, the matriarch of that herd she's not necessarily looking for competition. So if you're out there blowing a, a normal cow call, a mature sounding cow call, that's not necessarily what she wants to hear and come over to and pull her herd bull over there. She may actually take him away. Um, so even in that scenario, a, a calf call is a, is a better, better choice. I've also found if you're looking to call in cows, that making, getting in close and making aggressive bull sounds tends to bring them in. Um, sometimes even raking or a combination of making bull sounds and raking. I've had cows come right into that. Good stuff right there. Yeah. Uh, limited to hunting one drainage due to terrain. What calling strategy would you use? And this is Colorado archery. So limited okay. to one drainage due to terrain. What calling strategy would you use? I would say the first thing I would do, and this is, this is not how, I don't think everyone would do it this way, but this is probably because of my personality. I would tend to start out being a, a more on the conservative side, more on the take their temperature side. You know what I mean, Jay? I would start by, you know, using less aggressive calls, you know, cow calling, um, you know, non-aggressive cow calling. Um, to see if I get bugling. And if I'm not getting bugling first thing in the morning, I don't feel like I would be a guy who would go tramping all over the place, stinking everything up with human scent and blowing my calls every time my left foot hit the ground. I would be more of the approach, you know, hopefully he'd be able to keep that drainage to himself. That would be the best scenario because you never know if other people are going to be in there and what they're going to do. Um, but if I was hunting it, it as if it was just me and I had that drainage, I would always have that take their temperature mentality and I would be waiting for that time when I, you know, blow that call at first gray light and I get a response and then I would know, okay, it's time to play the game now. And, uh, you know, I would use that approach that I've used for so many years where, you know, I go to that bull without making a bunch of sounds, a bunch of calls as I'm approaching him, I would try to get inside of, you know, that 150, 120 yard range and set up and try to cow call him in. That is if, if I'm assuming he's a satellite bull. Steve, why is calling to elk as you're moving towards them a problem? So, sometimes I, th I feel like you give that bull the impression that he's in control of the game. You know, if you're approaching and you're just calling and calling and calling, you give him that feeling that he's in control. And if you do that the whole way in, and then all of a sudden you stop and expect him all of a sudden to change the scenario that's played out and make him come to you, then that's just not, he's not ready to do that. Um, the only time I will call my way into an elk is if I'm using that estra scream. And that's a completely different scenario 
and you know one that i don't use that often because that's in my, my mind is such an aggressive loud call um, that that's the only way i'm doing it and when i'm doing that i literally walk right up until i'm going to have a, a, a you know a, a train wreck with them so to speak we're going to meet head to head and set up there at the last minute that's the only time i'm going to call my way in but otherwise yeah, I'm going to get them to bugle and I'm going to move in, get close, and then I'm going to do my absolute best to call softly and sweetly um, versus loud and harsh at them. Do you think one of the biggest mistakes elk uh, elk callers, elk hunters make is their abrasiveness and harshness and volume of their call? I do, Jay. And, uh, you know, I, that's one thing I try to do when I practice because I, I find when I practice, I tend to call louder than I feel like is optimal out, out there in the woods. I, I feel like the softer and sweeter you can be, the better it is most times, especially, like I said, in that scenario where a bull's bugling, say, at a half a mile away and you close the distance and now you're 120 yards and your first call at him is very loud and abrupt, that's not going to be good most times. It's going to be you want to introduce yourself very subtly and softly to him. So I think a guy wants to practice, you know, more so being soft and subtle uh, as opposed to being loud and harsh. Steve, I remember years and years ago um, when we were guiding together and, and hunting together and um, – Primos at the time was sending us calls, and um, I remember you catching on video the the cow elk making that, and had six or eight bulls around uh, her, and 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 Will Primos kind of dubbed it the chapel scream. Um, <laughs> since <Not> about saying that. <laughs> since then, he was calling it the chapel scream. I remember, and you know it's been dubbed the estrus scream and estrus wine, all that different stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's like I'm going back in my mind. It's like playing in slow motion in my mind. I remember it as if it was yesterday when, when it really a light bulb went off in your head and you were like, listen to this. Um, but I almost feel like it's, became, it's become a call that people really try and mimic and really try and use, but they overuse it and they don't use it in the right circumstance. I'm curious your opinion on that. Yeah, Jay, that's a call that I never mix in, so to speak. Um, you know, if I'm calling and I'm making cow calls to a bull and he's coming in, I am not going to throw that call in there. I'm going to stick with what is bringing him in and stay with that. If it's being soft and sexy, that's what I'm going to stay with. Um, you know, and on the flip side, if I'm using that call, that's basically the sound I, 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 I'm making, um, you know, without throwing a bunch of other things in there. But, but I think you're right. Just throwing that call in out there indiscriminately, um, you know, mixing it in with uh, what some people call herd talk. I, I kind of think that's a mistake. Um, cause you don't hear it when you hear that sound, yeah. typically it's just that sound. Yeah. Like I've, and, I, yeah. you know, I'm around elk for 45 days a year during the rut, you know, from September one to October 15th. And at the Ot six ranch, get to hear every sound under the sun. Uh, and yeah. when you hear that sound other than other bulls uh, or other than bulls bugling, I the elk just are quiet. The cow elk are quiet other than the cow that's making that sound. Yeah, absolutely. Is that, I mean, is, that, do you that agree cow, with that? Oh, totally. And that cow in particular that you're talking about that I filmed in 3C um, a few years back, that was exactly the scenario. There was like three bulls around. There was a herd of cows there with a herd bull. And that cow comes walking up from the drainage below me making that sound. She probably came from three or 400 yards away. I could hear her making it the whole way. That was the only sound she was making. The, the cows in the herd were being completely quiet. They weren't saying a thing. The herd bull started bugling to her when she was making that sound. The wind was a little sketchy, and I was thinking, oh, my goodness, is she going to win me before I see her and get this on video? But it just happened to work out. I mean, she walked up 
to within 10 or 15 yards of me, walked right out in front of me and just did it right, turned and did it right at me, almost like, this is what you've been looking for. Here you go, big boy, <laughs> and, and hammered it out. And meanwhile, another bull started bugling, a, a pretty good-sized satellite bull started bugling, and he came running up the drainage. And uh, the herd bull and him fought momentarily there and uh, the herd bull won the fight and um, he circled around that cow that was making the sound pulled her into the harem and, and took off and then i followed that satellite bull i probably followed him for about a quarter of a mile away and then when i felt like we had quite a bit of separation between me and that herd bull i i made my you know best rendition of that sound that cow was making and that bull just came that satellite bull came charging into me yeah, I remember you telling me all about it and you got it on film. Um, okay, so my question is, if you had to pin it on a certain, say, 7 to 10 day window, when would you use that call the most? And, you know, like when is too early? Like if, you know, or maybe you totally disagree and you can use it for 30 days. But give me like when you're noticing this in this time, this is when that call would work. Yeah, Jay, if, if I were to pick seven to 10 days and when I've used it the most, I would have to say it would be, you know, the 18th to 20th of September. Start to, on a start date? Yeah, on a start date to, to early October. Okay. Is, is when I would use it the most. Yes. And you, would you say that you've never, you've heard the sound outside of that window, but have you heard it with that intensity outside of that window? Correct. I have heard it. In the summertime, when cows are with their calves, um, I think, you know, it can have different meanings um, according to the intensity level. But I do feel like that when you hear that turned up intensity, yeah, that's happening during the rut, obviously. And, and to me, it just has a little more of a desperation sound at that time. Steve, one question I have for you as well is, you know, I watch... Um, a lot of the elk calling contests, I, I should say I listen. I don't watch much, but I listen. And it's a lot like turkey um, in that I feel like the competitions have been made so fancy um, and the sounds have been, you know, so niche and like, you know, it, I wish we could get back to just pure sounds. Same with turkey. I mean, I hear some of the stuff that, you know, I'm just like, Turkey's not doing that. A hen Turkey is not doing that. Yeah. Uh, you are the best elk caller I've ever been around. Not only external mouth call, bugle, cow call, you name it, but you don't get fancy. Yes. You can blow these fancy calls, but you don't get fancy. I'm curious your thoughts, what you think about that. Yeah, Jay, that, that's one reason I don't get in calling contests. Number one is because I think my knees would buckle and I would uh, get nervous. And first off, so I give those guys <laughs> a lot of props and a for lot sure. of credit. For sure. those calls, no doubt. And they're great callers and they make great sounds for sure. But I think part of my thing is, like you say, I'm more of that guy that's just looking to make quality sounds as opposed to quantity. And I know a lot of times in those calling contests, especially with cow calling they're just looking for that barrage that herd sound so to speak and i'm just not that guy i i can't even if i were to sit here in my office and try to just unleash unleash a barrage of cow calls i really can't do that um it's just not how i learned to call and when i'm out there in the woods um just like you're alluding to i'm looking to to make more you know singular quality calls than i am to go out there and just fill the woods with a symphony of calls, so to speak. So, Yeah, and um, I don't want to come across either that I'm saying that the guys calling in the contest are, are you know, not great guys and not m making great <laughs> sounds. I almost right. feel like it's almost a judge's thing, and what they're yeah. being judged on is too fancy. Like, let's get back to just pure, like, unbelievable quality, pure sounds rather than some of this stuff that, you know, if, if you took into the woods 99% of the time, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Like it, when they, I don't, I don't know how it's being done exactly right now. I think they're going to more of a bracket style uh, competition with RMEF uh, nationals. Um, but outside of that, I'm not sure if it's, if they give them a minute 
to cow call and a minute to bull call. And if they're expecting to just hear a barrage of noise, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, that scenario, I think a guy who sounds good but can make a lot of sound obviously has an advantage over a guy who, you know, is not so much inclined to do that. Um, but, yeah, like you say, many of those guys who are winning the contests are super successful out there elk hunting because I think they can compartmentalize it and then go out to the field and uh, hone their calling to, you know, hunting situations. Sure, absolutely. Yep. Uh, next question, what caliber rifle is best to use for elk? Oh, that's, you know, going to depend somewhat on the person, their age, their stature. You know, for me to say, you know, that a 12-year-old girl should be shooting a 300 mag, um, that's probably a stretch. But, Jay, if I were to say, you know, in all my years of guiding, I, I would say that the most success I've seen has, has come from, you know, hunters using 300 mags and 7 mags. Of, of some sort you know there's all kinds of calibers out there you know the old classic legendary seven remington mag is a great caliber with the right bullet um the newer caliber the 28 nosler i have one myself it is an elk killer for sure with the right bullet i've been using uh, the eldx bullet out of that um you know three awesome bullet it is it is um but you make a great point like a bullet is just as much a part of the equation as the rifle yeah i mean you wouldn't want to be using say a ballistic silver tip bullet or a ballistic tip bullet you know that would be uh, more of a bullet for you know antelope hunting or, or predators who's deer exactly right. where looking for that you know real rapid expansion and you know the bullet to to really do massive damage when it contacts whereas with an elk you need penetration because they are thick hided heavy boned especially if you're shooting at them and it's a little bit of an angle shot you need a bullet that's going to penetrate stay together uh, mushroom and retain most of its weight that's what you're looking for another great caliber um I've got a Bergara Wilderness Ridge in 300 PRC, and that thing is an elk smasher, that caliber. Is, it seems to be fairly mild to shoot, although I have to say I'm shooting a suppressor. I'm shooting suppressed. Um, I would encourage anyone, um, if, if they can, it took me about a year to go through the process with the paperwork and approval and everything. It is a night and day difference, Jay, and I don't know that I could shoot unsuppressed anymore. From a honest. shooting standpoint or from an after-the-shot animal behavior standpoint? Yeah, all of that, really. Um, I think, for me, um, you know, if I'm in a hunting scenario and I'm not able to protect my ears, I feel like I'm more afraid of the blast of the gun. I'm going to noise flinch more than I am going to flinch at the recoil. So when you can take that out of the equation, uh, when I put my this suppressor, this Griffin armament suppressor that I've got on either that 28 nozzle or that 300 PRC, I would say the noise level is about a 22 Magnum is about what it sounds like. Um, and I know when I'm guiding hunters, the first thought that seriously comes into my mind when the gun goes off <laughs> is that was loud enough. Yeah. It wasn't loud enough to kill an elk. And then that elk is tipping over an instant later. And I'm like, well, I guess it's not about noise. It's about performance. So how does it work um, at Red Mesa when you have big groups of elk and, and you know, compared to over the years of, of having the big caliber guns go off and the blast go off compared to the suppress, uh, suppressor that you're using now? Oh, yeah, it's a night and day difference. Um, typically, when they hear it go off, they just stand there. They don't really know if it's something bad, and especially if you call just a little bit. Don't overcall, but just a little bit. They'll literally just stand there and sometimes go back to feeding with a dead elk laying there. I remember on this uh, episode that I'm working on finishing up, I literally said to my hunter on camera, I said, these elk are, gonna, are trying to spoil our walk-up. <laughs> because <laughs> they, they won't leave. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it does make a big difference that way. You know, when someone, say, for instance, on a late rifle hunt where you may need to shoot more than once. I mean, obviously, shooting the first time at an unspooked elk that doesn't know anything's wrong, is that's your best shot always. But if, God forbid, you have to shoot more than once, you know, having that quieter rifle is definitely going to give you an advantage. Definitely. Uh, next question. Best tips for new archery elk hunters 
Jay, for me, I tell you, like I said earlier, I learned to elk hunt not only from my dad, but from watching people on video, you know, and back in the nineties, you know, that was Will Primos, that was Wayne Carlton. I, I watched those videos, not, you know, of course to be entertained, but I watched what they were doing, what calls they were making, when they were making them, you know, when they fell called versus when they bugled all of that. And I just learned, I feel like I learned so much from that. I know the first time, that I went to the woods with a bow in my hands to hunt elk. I killed an elk that first time I went out in the early 90s. And, and again, I attribute it not only to my dad, but to, but to like Will Primos and Wayne Carlton from watching them and how they did that. And I remember when I hiked up that steep mountainside, heard that bull bugling, well, a cow called, got him to bugle, cut the distance way down. I think I got probably within about 120 yards of him, that magical distance and cow called back behind myself and that bull came running down the hill right to me and I shot him and he died right there. I remember saying to myself, gosh, that was easy. <laughs> and <laughs> I found over the years that it's not that easy. Most times, you know, my first time was, was pretty miraculous, but um, yeah, I would say to just, you know, soak that in, learn, learn from people. Um, I think, Lots of people have something to offer, you know, if, if, you, if you think something doesn't fit your style, then pick something that person does well, emulate that, pick something from someone else. Um, obviously, always take wind in the, into the equation. I'm amazed at how many times uh, people will ignore the wind when they're hunting elk, and that's the most important thing. Um, yeah, aside from that, I would just say, you know, kind of kind of learn – elk learn their tendencies um you know they, they need water they need feed they need cover all of those things that, that they like in general they, they they're more reclusive and they like quieter situations than than deer do it seems like to me other than there's some elk in arizona that are used to highways and they'll tolerate you know some human activity and all of that but in general elk like it quieter than noisier um and then also I would say um, look to become a caller and add that to your, you know, your arsenal and uh, practice that. That just opens up a whole nother dimension to you, especially as an archery hunter. Um, when you've got that, you know, to your advantage and you're not just having to stalk all the time because I'm not a patient enough guy to stalk all the time. So I give credit to guys like, you know, Randy Omer and Dar and, you know, guys like that. Um, I think it's tough, tough. You got to be, you got to be gritty to hunt like that. It's fun to call them for sure. Um, yeah. All right. Number one thing you look at, let's see. The number one thing you look at when you have to make a quick judgment on a bull and your client is set on a 350 plus bull. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> and I'll be the first to admit I have made mistakes. And I'll tell, I'll tell this guy the first way I've made mistakes is when I get a front on view or a rear view. And I judge that bull only by that look. You've got to have a side view to see point length. So what I'm looking for in a bull is, is curvy looking points with belly, you know, or curve in them. So I want to first glance at the bottoms and make sure that they have nice roll and belly to them, you know, because then you're typically going to be looking at a 15 inch plus point. Um, then I'm, I'm going to look at the thirds and the fifths. And I'm going to look for strong thirds that have that, you know, that roll and that belly to them. Because for a, to have a 350 bull, you, you typically are going to need, you know, 15 inch plus thirds. Same way on the fifths, you're going to need to have, you know, 12, 14 inch plus fifths. And then I'm just going to glance and, and just try to get an overall feel for is he Does he look beamy or does he look compact? Because if he looks kind of compact as far as beam length, I don't feel like most bulls can be 350 unless they have super great point length if they kind of look compact. So again, I'm kind of just quickly looking at the, the bottoms to see if they have belly and curve. And then I'm looking at the thirds and the fifths. And then I'm obviously going to look and make sure there's no missing points anywhere. Sometimes bulls can have a real short G1 or be missing a point somewhere. Um, but yeah, that's what I'm looking for. 
Yeah, I was just going to the only thing I was going to add is um, that I know you look for as well. If you're if you've got someone that's really trophy conscious on what they're trying to shoot is make sure they're not missing a point, whether it's broken or whether it's uh, didn't grow. Um, you yeah. know, point length and long main beams that that's that's huge. And, you know, um, a lot of people talk about width and, you know, oh, I was a super wide bull, but percentage of score wise width you know, is the smallest number of percentage of score, uh, yes. in a category. But on the flip side of that, you could have a bull that, you know, looks like he's about a 345 bull, but all of a sudden he turns and he's super wide and he's, you know, he's close to 46 to 50 <laughs> inches wide. And right there you're adding, you know, eight, 10 inches of, of extra that, uh, of extra inches that you weren't counting on. So it pushes him over that 350. Conversely, if he's super narrow, you know, you got to watch that as well. Cause I feel like super narrow bulls, sometimes their beams look longer than they are when they're yeah. narrow. Um, yes. If they're wide, sometimes the beams are actually longer than you think because there's so much room for those beams to go. But when they're narrow, you got to watch that. They're not a, uh, you know, a, a if, if they're narrow, you got to watch that their, their spread credit. Um, I just lost my train of thought. If they're narrow, they can have short beams. If they're uh, wide, the beams are actually usually longer than what you think. What you think, yeah. And again, I would stress if you only have a quick look and it's head on or rear and you have to make a snap decision, usually the right call is to hold off because when I've made mistakes, it's always on those quick looks head on. Yeah, quick is always <laughs> tough. You always try and get several looks. Um, try not to rush it. Try and slow yourself down. Try and pick it apart. Uh, next question, where do elk bed in and around burns? Pockets that didn't burn, question mark, north-facing slopes. Yeah, I think he hit it right on the head. I mean, if there's any, um, what do they call it, Jay, mosaics? Mosaic, where, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mosaic, yeah. Where it didn't burn, big burns, even like the, you know, Rodeo Cheddar Sky Fire that hit 3C years ago. Um, there'll be pockets, there'll be mosaics where there's there's timber so that would be the first places to look for sure. And then aside from that, um, yeah, I would definitely tend to look more on the, you know, north, northish facing slopes for sure. Um, I believe if, if elk have no other option and there's no mosaics nearby, that they could bed, you know, in a burn, but obviously uh, where there's a little more cover versus just being moonscaped, no doubt. You guys out there at your Colorado ranch had a fire go through. Um, have there been circumstances or certain conditions where you've just seen them just bed right out in the middle of the burn? Is it typically like a colder day or have you seen yeah. that or do they typically move through it pretty quick? Usually, in general, they move through it fairly quick and they get to timber and they timber up. Um, but sometimes, yeah, like you say, in the afternoons, they'll surprise you and they'll come out really early and they'll be out in the burn and some will be up feeding and some will just be bedded down. Um, so yeah, you just never know. I'm sure that's according to, you know, moon phases and barometric pressure and some things that I just don't scientifically know all about, but, um, yeah, sometimes you can find them where you're going to least expect it question here if an elk barks is there any way to save yourself before the whole herd runs off jay i've had that happen a few times more than i'd like to admit <laughs> <laughs> me and you both <laughs> sometimes and especially if you don't see the elk that barks and all of a sudden you think you're in the chips and you hear one bark it about makes you have a heart attack sometimes um you know what I've done that seems to work fairly well is is to this sounds counterintuitive intuitive, but to bark back at them, to bark back at them, and and then it raises their curiosity, and they're kind of like, oh, well, that elk heard heard me bark, and and that elk thinks there's something wrong too. Um, I've had them literally come over to me when I'm barking back at them. Yeah, that's interesting. You wonder yeah. you wonder if they just think you know, you wonder what they think, but, um, I definitely think I've seen you actually bark back at them myself. And it does give you mat, uh, you know, if you're talking about a matter of seconds or minutes, yeah. it does save you some time is every time a, an elk bark and Steve barks at them, are they, you know, probably nine times out of 10, they're probably going to still run off. But if, if an elk barks and Steve barks back and, and you know, his early rifle hunters trying to get a shot, a lot of times that, that, 
you know, 10 second delay is all the time you need for your hunter to make the shot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cause sometimes, especially if there's a bull there, he'll mill around a little bit. And if he's in a spot where there's not a clear shot, sometimes it'll open up a shot for the hunter. Um, I would say the worst thing you can do is to blow regular calls at them. If they're barking at you, you and know, don't, to blow and don't blow your bread and butter call at them because they, Amen. they, they just associate <laughs> your bread and butter call. So if you go to get on them later that day or the next day, you're don't blow if they're spooked do not call at them with your best junk you got because then you've just blown it <laughs> that right there is gospel jay <laughs> <laughs> yep i couldn't agree more <laughs> okay um steve question about your external read calls and i'll try and kind of paraphrase it um I'll kind of throw some of my, not only are you a phenomenal elk caller with a mouth read, but I feel like you've kind of, in my mind, taken calls and going way back to external read calls. And you've kind of, for a long time, those were what I would call your bread and butter. Now I would argue, you know, you're, you're incredible at external read calling, but your mouth calling is, is every bit as good when that was kind of your bread and butter talk about the manufacturing and design of these external read calls that now you have your name on have had your name on for years and how that's kind of progressed yeah jay i feel like someone who's not um, an expert at mouth calls or is just getting into it obviously you know at some point you want to learn to blow a mouth call and perfect it as much as you can because your hands are free and it's got a totally different sound. Um, but I feel like, gosh, most guys, if they if they were to, you know, become solid on open read calls, they could call in more elk than they could even imagine. And I feel like it's because those calls have a, a, a nasally three-dimensional full sound. They, they, they just sound elky to me. That's and hard for someone to a lot of people that have done it for 30 years to get with a mouth call. What you're saying is you could take someone that has very little experience and they tend to make better sounds on an, on an open read call, uh, than someone that's worked and worked and worked on a mouth call quicker. Yes, they could quicker master an open read call. I feel like, um, again, I don't think it's a call that you can just buy at the store and run out to the field and start hunting the next day. I think they take practice, um, you need to learn to be able to tone it down and call, you know, more subtly and sexy, I call it. Um, a big thing for me with open reads, uh, you know, I have this trophy wife and heartbreaker call right now that I that uh, I work with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls. I've been, gosh, this is the 11th year I've been working with them, so it's been phenomenal. Um, but what I really look to do with open read calls is is first off, you need to have a mylar read that's more on the wider side versus the skinnier side, because I feel like that wider width on a mylar reed is going to give you by design that fuller, more three dimensional sound versus a thin skinny reed. That's going to give you more of a predator ish one dimensional type sound. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Jay You've blown a lot of calls like a, ten, uh, a tinny kind of call a tinny yeah. sound, right? Yeah. And then also, um, I like the soundboard to, to be flatter. In other words, when I look at that Mylar reed, does it sit down real close or on that soundboard? Is there just a tiny gap there? I like that flatter angle because, again, I feel like it gives you more elky type sounds, more full, rich sounds. Let me ask you a quick question. Are you mm -hmm. saying you want more contact area between the soundboard and the reed or less contact area? Uh, I would say more right. contact. Right. Okay. The, only way, the only place it should separate is out there at toward the end, you know, towards your mouth. Sure. Now, I do put the call in my mouth quite a ways, and I feel like the castration band is an important part of most open read calls. My open reads at Trophy Wife and Heartbreaker, they both have castration bands, and I tell guys that I usually replace those castration bands um, at least once a year. And if your call all of a sudden is not as sweet as it was for you, many times just replacing that castration band can make all the difference. 
I also like to put that castration band, I like to slide it in toward the barrel of the call, I would say about 80% in. In other words, I don't have it out close to the tip of the call, but I have it slid in deep toward the barrel of the call. It just, for me, works better and sounds better. Um, but, but yeah, those are the things that I look for, the, that wider uh, mylar reed, that flatter soundboard. And, um, and, and then when I blow the call, I think I've talked to you about this before, kind of my secret is uh, I use a light pair of gloves it just seems to dampen the sound. Uh, it seems like when I just use bare hands, although I will call some like that, it seems like the call is a little louder and a little harsher versus when I have a, a pair of gloves on it and I deflect the sound just a little bit. It with, sweetens it up, don't you think? Yeah, it takes I, any imperfection out of the out of the sound that would literally go by your hand and dampens it, sweetens it in my mind. I mean, I've heard yeah. you call both ways and those those gloves that you probably still have the same pair that you had 20 years ago, probably wear the same pair knowing you. Um, it, <laughs> yeah. just, it makes all the difference in the world. I I've been doing that as well. And I can't believe how much better it sounds when you wear those light gloves. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a huge difference. And you know, I'm kind of biased toward my open reads. I would definitely recommend people to try mine, but in general, if they're looking at other open read calls out there, I feel like if they go by what I'm saying here, looking at the Mylar read, looking at the soundboard, they're going to pick a better open read call by using, you know, that, that strategy um, and staying away from those that have that skinny read. And don't you think too, don't grab that thing like it's a, baseball bat hold on to that thing like it's i mean what would be your best description on your pressure and actually how you hold your fingers and and i encourage people go to steve's website go to his youtube channel you can actually watch him on lots of videos watch and mimic exactly exactly how he holds the call in his right hand i mean he's right-handed but yeah watch how he holds his his ring finger and his pinky, he flares them up. Talk about how important, and I know you've, you've, held, you've held that call in any direction you, or any manner you can. Why is that the way you found? And again, people listening, Steve is the best external read, open read caller by far in the world. And I'm telling you, <laughs> I'm not blowing wow. smoke. This is, I would tell Steve if he sucked, he would, if he sucked, I'd tell him he sucked. He is the best. So if you want to learn to open read call, mimic every single thing that he is doing and it will up your game. But Steve, why did you come up with holding it like that? And why, I know you have an answer. Why is that the way you would recommend everyone hold the call? Yeah, Jay, thanks for saying that. that. That means the world to me. I, I have actually learned a lot from you calling as well. Um, so I want to be sure and say that. Um, I just try to think about relaxing every part of my body when I call. If anything is tight or tense, and like you said, if it starts with gripping the call tightly, that's going to tend to make you blow louder, more harsh, Huff, huffing air out of your mouth rather than getting it from deep down in your stomach. So that grip on the call, I feel like is very important. I want it to be relaxed to the point where if I let loose anymore, if I loosen my grip anymore, the call would literally just drop out of my hands. I just want to have that just nice relaxed grip. I kind of want to encircle the, the barrel of the call with my thumb and forefinger. And then like you say, I'm going to use my ring finger and my pinky, pinky finger to just deflect the sound ever so slightly and sometimes flare it out, sometimes bring it down just to give it a little different sound. Um, but by having that just nice soft grip, it just kind of gives my, my whole body that countenance of being relaxed. Um, I also try to think about my breathing and taking deep breaths, breathing in deep through my nose and you know out through my mouth and just really getting myself in that relaxed state. Sometimes even trying to put myself back in my truck or my office, so to speak, where it kind of is my comfort zone. Because the first thing for anyone, including me, especially when you first get out there in the woods every year, you hear a bull bugling, you get up there close, you get up there to call, 
and it's very easy to kind of tense up and not even think about your breathing or your grip on the call and get yourself tense. And that's when that first sound that comes out is not exactly what you're looking for. How important, you hit a nail on the head, how important is it to make your A1 call right off the bat? Oh, yeah, I feel like it's it's, it's everything, really, because that's your first introduction to that bull. It's the first time he's heard you up close. Maybe he's heard you at a distance to locate him, but when you get up there close, it's so much different. And uh, that's when I feel like it, you got to make that great first impression. So, you know, when I practice... A lot of times I'll just blow calls kind of flippantly, but then I also like even when I'm, you know, thinking about shooting my bow, I like to think when I blow this call right now, I'm going to make a single cow call and, I will, and I'm going to act as if I'm making it at that bull and I'm in the field and, I, and I'm trying to make it come out as a quality sound. Steve, what do you think uh, some of the pitfalls of open read calls are as far as the actual call themselves kind of not performing well? What conditions are those and what can people do to eliminate that? That's a great question, Jay, and one that I, I wouldn't even have thought to say this, this stuff. To me, a big part of an open read call sounding well is keeping it up to temperature and by that, I mean, if you're out there hunting and it's, you know, 30 or 40 degrees in the morning and you have that call hanging out outside of your body or outside of your jacket and it's out there in that 30 or 40 degree weather and that reed is, is cold and the soundboard and everything is that temperature and you start blowing on that call. First off, I don't feel like it's going to sound as good with the reed not being up to your body temperature, but then it's also going to condensate very quickly. And, you know, you're going to get that spit under the reed between the reed and the soundboard, and it's going to cause it to stick right away. And a lot of times that happens right when you need it to the least. So that's a big thing that I do is I always carry, I typically carry at least a couple of open reed calls, and I always keep them inside of my jacket. Or if it's the afternoon hunt, I even if it's the afternoon hunt, I put them under a layer, under my top layer, and keep them in there up by my body to keep them up to temperature just because I feel like that's so important. When they do get wet, what do you do? Switch calls? I, I usually do. It seems like, you know, to try to roll up the castration band and take your shirt tail and put it underneath. I mean, that's what you can do. You can put it underneath the reed between the reed and the soundboard. Got to be kind of careful because you don't want to, you know, bend the reed too much because you can affect how it sounds. Um, but yeah, I'll typically have another, uh, call that I've, you know, practiced on and, you know, pretty sweet to, um, that I will go to and have a backup. Definitely. As a, as a designer of those calls and working with the company that you do Rocky mountain hunting calls, um, not all calls are created equal. How do you, as a designer, try and have a u uniformity to, being able to walk in and, and buy it off the shelf or literally have Steve send you a call. How do you, as a designer, make sure, I guess, quality control that those calls universally are right where they need to be? Yeah, absolutely, Jay. And, and I've had some instances where we've gotten a call pretty quickly. You know, we've, we've come to, uh, I think the trophy wife happened fairly quickly. Um, but some of the others, I think it was the, the matriarch um, that I first came out with in 2010. Um, I, I know I went back and forth with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls on that one several times. And I just didn't feel like the call was putting, putting out that tone that I was looking for. And, you know, maybe my ears a little different than other people's ears, no doubt about that. But it just wasn't the sound that I was looking for. And again, it's that three-dimensional, nasally uh, just sweet, sexy sound. And, uh, you know, when I, when I hear that sound, when I blow a call and it makes that sound, I know it right away. And if, if it's not, um, I don't care how long it takes, we're going to go back to the drawing board and try something else. Um, but I found foundationally that it, it typically, if you start out with that, you know, wider width mylar reed, um, that's more on the thin side also, I should mention, instead of a thick, 
a thick reed is going to be harder to blow. You're going to have to put more air pressure to it because it you know takes more to make it vibrate. So it's by design going to be louder and harsher. So I'm looking for you know the thinner mylar reed as well as you know and and having the good width, and then that nice flatter soundboard angle. Um, that seems to be a very good starting point uh, for a good open reed cow call. Good stuff. Uh, question here from the real bearded hunter: What makes you choose one open reed call over another in certain situations? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, Jay, I think for me, it just comes down to confidence and what I'm feeling. Um, and sometimes that can vary a little bit. Um, I know there's some some weeks where I feel like the trophy wife is really working well for me and really sounding good. Um, so I'll kind of stick with what's working and what I'm most confident in. Um, I, I'm a little less of a guy to experiment, if you know what I mean. Maybe that's a weakness of mine. Um, because I have found scenarios where I remember one in particular, I was blowing my matriarch at a bull and initially he was bugling to it. And then he kind of cooled off and, and kind of, you know, gave you that question bugle instead of that aggressive statement type bugle. And I thought, Oh man, he's not going to come in. And I was with a hunter in unit nine and uh, that particular morning I switched to the trophy wife and that, that call we've talked about it. It has a little brighter sound, a little more pizzazz to it. And it made all the difference with that bull. When he heard that sound with a little brighter, more pizzazz, he came right in. Um, so I would say if you're in a scenario where what you're blowing, obviously it's not working and the bull's not coming to it, or if he cools down to it, that would be a good time to try something different. Um, but again, for me, it's kind of what I'm feeling sweet to and confident with more so than anything. Steve, um, speaking real, just real honest and, and keeping it real here. Do you think it's important that hunters out there that are listening, that are getting into calling or that are calling, you know, they, they get a buddy and say, Hey, listen to my calls and critique my calls. I feel like there's guys, we've all been in those situations where a buddy pulls out the call and you're like, whether it's turkey or, or <laughs> elk, and you're just like, dude, I'm, I love you, but you need to put that away. Do you think people <laughs> could get more feedback by either having their buddy listen or, you know, making an audio tape and sending it to someone and say, what do you really think? Do you see any merit in that? I do. Um, it, it definitely would come down to if that buddy's going to be brutally honest with you. and Or lie you, to you. <laughs> yeah, you sound or, great. And if you feel like you're okay with it, if he slams you, you know what I mean, and tells you it's bad and tells you what you need to do. If you're going to take it personally, then I probably wouldn't wouldn't ask someone's opinion. Um, but yeah, I think the, the best thing a person can do is record themselves and listen listen to it back. Because many times you don't really know how you sound because you're hearing it so up close. Right. As opposed to hearing it on a recording. I remember it, it made me chuckle, Jay, when you said that a minute ago. Because I, I had a buddy years ago. And, yeah, he was just cow calling incessantly in my truck with a mouth diaphragm. And I said exactly what, what you did. I said, dude, you got to stop that. You're ruining my mojo. <laughs> I said, you're polluting my brain. You're going to throw me off. <laughs> yeah. And I, I said it jokingly serious, if you know what I mean. But, you know, he said, what do I need to do, do different? I said, man, you need to just tear it all down and start over. Start you know? over. <laughs> yeah. Speaking yeah. of that, I mean, when it gets closer to elk season, it seems like every year I get eight or ten different guys sending me on Instagram a little video of them calling. And, and I don't mind at all giving, you know, constructive criticism but understand that if you do send me and i'm gonna i'm gonna literally tear it apart from one end to the other and yep. i've had nine times out of ten those guys after the season send me a message back and say wow that really helped i'm glad you know but don't send me something if you don't want my opinion if you want my honest opinion send it and i'll be happy to kind of give you some ideas or some criticism but if you're easy to get your feelings hurt or if you think, you know, you're a hot shot and you're really not, like you're going to, you know, and it's, yeah, just the, you don't it's, wanna... it's just the way I am. If, if you want to get better <laughs> and not, the, I mean, I would do the same thing to Steve. I'd, I've sent him stuff before and he's like, eh, I don't really like that. Um, 
but don't, you know, I think it's good to get criticism on your calling. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're, you're not ready to hear Simon Cowell slam you on the ground. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe, don't maybe send don't. it. <laughs> okay. Next question. Yeah. Um, I drew Arizona 5B rifle with very, very few points. I've never hunted that late or elk that late. Any advice? And and let's make this late elk in general, Steve, not just 5B. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, congratulations to that person for sure. Definitely an opportunity to get out there and hunt, which beats staying at home any day. Um, I would say the first thing, is go to the field with realistic expectations. And and by that I mean don't expect to necessarily see elk every single day you're out there. These late hunts are tough. They're a grind. They're more by and large, other than say like units like 23 and 27 and maybe one and a couple of others, they are more of an opportunity hunt. And in general, you're going to have right around a 30% success rate. So in other words, 70% of people are going home with nothing. And many of those people won't even see an elk. Um, so it's easy to get dejected. And of those 30% of the people who take an elk, most of those are going to be two and a half year old bulls and spikes, um, being real about it. Um, I know on that 5B hunt and on many others, there's lots of tags. I think there's seven or 800 tags on that 5B hunt. They can hunt both north and south. Um, so they're going to expect to see a lot of people out there. Um, I, I would tell them they need to get to places where, where, where people can't see it from the road. So if you're glassing and looking at faces and things that are easy to access and look at from a road, in general, you're not going to see as many elk as if you hike off and get yourself out there and look at faces that people would have to hike to and can't easily see from a road. Um, so obviously with that comes, you know, uh, using the best optics that you can afford. Um, you know, I think 10s, 12s, and 15s can all have a place uh, with late elk hunting. Um, if you're using 10s, you definitely need something with higher power or a spotting scope to, you know, back it up and, and, and see what you're really looking at. Um, and having them on a tripod is paramount. Um, I know for me, I don't feel like I can even really glass effectively for two or three minutes hand holding. Um, you know, so they're going to want to make sure they're, they're set up to glass off a tripod, have something, uh, comfortable when they're glassing to sit on a cushion, uh, to where they're comfortable and, you know, not sitting on the hard, cold ground, uh, or they're going to get impatient and fidgety. Um, you know, and then aside from that, if, if glassing doesn't work, they just might have to just do it the old fashioned way and just, you know, beat the brush and, you know, go into the thicker stuff and hike around and, and still hunt is what I call it. You know, you're not just thrashing, so to speak, you're, you're, you're hiking with a purpose, you're being slow and methodical about it and you're glassing and you're looking to find an elk before they see you. That may be something that they have to do if they can't, you know, find an elk glassing. And I would tell them um, that, you know, no matter what their trophy expectations are, hopefully they're just looking to take, you know, really any bull. Um, then they could have a, a satisfactory hunt. If they're looking to take a, 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 a six-point bull, I would say on that type of hunt, really any six-point bull is a good bull to take uh, that late in the year uh, because these elk are hard to find late. So. Yeah, I would just say go to the field uh, with a positive attitude, but a realistic expectation and uh, make the most of an opportunity if you happen to, to see a bull and, um, and and just go at it with a glass half full mentality. Yeah, and I would add also on those late hunts, it seems as though those elk pull back into those nasty, thick canyons with, you know, yeah. thick manzanita. Speaking specifically for Arizona, you know, the, the thickest brush. Um, the thickest vegetation, a lot of times if you can glass those, you know, shady slopes where if you imagine from, you know, say 10 o'clock till, till dark, where is the shadiest spot? A lot of times those bulls will yep. be on the north and northeast facing slopes, um, especially really thick slopes. You know, they like pinion juniper. Uh, they like that manzanita. They like pine. You know, they like their cover. Um you know, by that time they've been chased around quite a bit. So, and then yep. the other thing, especially for Arizona elk hunters, 
I'm going to say get up on those cone knobs, but if you can find canyons where you can be on one ridge line looking yep. across into a north or northeast facing slope, using the terrain to use your eyes to see across, but be in a position where you could either shoot from your position or move to shoot, that's a lot easier than some of these units in Arizona where it's relatively flat and you've got these cone knobs and you get up on the cone knob and you see the elk but you have yep. no way to shoot the elk. So picking yep. an area, Arizona late season, I think you could use this in any state, is try and pick the terrain where you're going to be able to glass them and be able to put a stock on them and shoot them where they're at. Absolutely. Yeah, and as we know, there's just a handful of units that lend themselves better to late hunting. You know, and my favorite unit during the rut nine is not so much my favorite unit during late season. So that's a great point you make there, Jay. Yep. Canyons are what that. Next question. Thoughts on large numbers of tags for some Arizona elk units? Yeah, I think, you know, by and large, the Arizona Game and Fish Department does do a nice job on managing the elk and, you know, picking units that they manage for trophy quality, those alternative management units. Those are what, Jay? One, nine, 10, 27, 23. Yep. Yeah, those units, they put on an alternative management program. Um, and that's you know, where they're they're going for a higher bull-to-cow ratio, so they're, they're trying to get more bulls um, than, say, some of the other units, some of the more mid-tier units where they allow uh, for less bulls uh, per cows than more bulls per, per cows. Absolutely. Yeah, and in general, that makes for a better, uh, you know, rut experience when you've got more competition and more bulls there. Um, but I do feel like, you know, for people who aren't, you know, super picky, um, you know, you got units like 6A, uh, 6B, uh, you know, 8 somewhat, um, you know, just many others, I'm sure I'm, I'm not naming <laughs> all of them by any means but that are going to have better draw odds and give people the opportunity to get out there and hunt. So I think whether you're a trophy hunter, you're somewhere in the middle, or you're just looking for meat for the freezer, there's options for everyone, um, you know, just based on what you select on your application. And uh, I, I think it's, I think it's a great system. Yeah. Question here, tips. I think this is a great question. Tips for being a good client on an elk hunt going on my first guided elk hunt in Arizona this year. What should I do? Yeah, I love that, Jay. That's a really good question. I think that person will probably be a good client already because they're concerned about being a good client. Um, I would say that the first thing you can do to make a guide be at his best is, is to show up with a positive, friendly, encouraging attitude. Um, you know, if you instill confidence in that guide versus questioning him, I think if you, if you question a guide too much or in the wrong sort of way, it can really rob him of what I call his hunting instincts. And then instead of hunting instinctually and how he feels led to hunt, he's more worried about what you're thinking as the client. And that's when the hunt goes bad. I feel like, um, I would also say, um, <laughs> this is, this is kind of hard, to, hard to say, right. But don't be a flat liner, but don't talk too much either because <laughs> that guy, that guy is trying to, he's trying to concentrate. His mind is working. Even when you don't know it is when he's driving out there in the dark He's thinking about, you know, what he's going to do that morning, what roads he's going to turn on to get you to that spot. And if you're just filling the air with talk, I'm not saying don't be friendly, but if you over talk him, you can almost just distract him a little bit. Um, but then if you're a flatliner and don't say anything, then it can be awkward as well. So I would just say just, you know, be yourself. Um, just be natural, but but don't overdo it. Um, you know, always be friendly and encouraging and uh, b boost his confidence because I feel like in elk hunting and calling, especially confidence is everything. Um, I would also say, you know, be that client that looks to be a friend to him and look looks to help. Um, like, for instance, you know, if you're hunting out of his truck or his UTV or whatever, you know, take your, your garbage or get the garbage out of there or the water bottles or whatever every day and, you know, throw them in the trash. Just look to be a helper instead of having a serve me type attitude. Um, I know that means a lot to me 
as a guide when someone says, you know what, what can I do to help you, Steve? Do you need me to go get some water for the trailer or do you need some gas in your gas cans or, you know, clients like that are just amazing, if you know what I mean. And, and when you develop a good rapport with a guy and a friendship, that's when great things happen when you're out there in the field. Yeah. And also I would add to that, um, just listening, nodding at everything you're saying, but know that you've hired that guide for a reason. You've done your research and now yeah. let your research, you know, let your decision that you made and, and go with it. Now, right off the bat, first morning, the guide might make a mistake. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And the worst thing you can do is start second guessing your guide, questioning your guide and actually making him think you've made your decision on your guide. You've got to live and die with it. So at that point, you just laugh it off and say, we'll get the next one. Um, because yep. I know as a guide and, and trying to train young guides, you know, that, that work for me over the years and, and, and such like the worst thing you can do is like break their spirit right off the bat and have the client <laughs> questioning the guide. And then, then you've got a situation like what you're talking about where the guide then starts overthinking and he starts, you know, trying to get the client on elk and he's saying, well, is he going to like this? You know, the reality is just do yep. your job as a hunter, be ready yeah. to go, shoot your bow, shoot your rifle, you know, have your gear ready, be on time. You know, when the guide says, Hey, we're leaving at five o'clock, be ready at five o'clock, um, and have a positive attitude. I think being positive, even when things go sideways, I have a funny joke about probably 10, 12 years ago, or maybe even longer in Arizona, we're, we've chased some bulls and we're hiking back to the truck and we are literally thrashing through some manzanita thickets that I probably should have circumvented, but I thought we could work our way through the ridge. <laughs> And we are, I mean, I know you've been in the same type of situation, Steve, you're neck deep in Manzanita. You can't even reach the ground. You're like standing on branches and just cat claw and crap hit yeah. you in the face. And I turn around and look back at, at my client, actually his son. And I look back and I go, just think you're paying for this. And we <laughs> sat there in that Manzanita thicket. I mean, literally just had to like, just finally just give up and lay there and laugh about, you know, what kind of a pile right. I got him, got us into, but breaking the ice and having them just laugh and, and, and have fun with it, um, kind of meant everything. And we had such a phenomenal hunt, but know that, you know, you're going to go on a guided hunt. You're going to have situations that either external factors, you know, other hunters, things screwed up, weather, there's things the guide cannot control and there's even things the guide can control, but let's face it, we're all humans. Um, but if you look at it more of as hunting with your buddy and just having a good time and laughing off the, the, you know, the struggles and, and, you know, enjoying those great moments, that's when you're going to have those magical hunts. Oh, totally. Jay. That, that's great. That made me laugh and smile inside when you told that story. I couldn't, <laughs> And that kind of reminds me of a couple of other things. And another thing that comes to mind for me is if you're on a rut hunt, don't call. Do not call when you're on a guided hunt. The only time you should call is if you're stopping a bull for a shot. If your guide is back behind you and calls an elk across in front of you and you need it to stop for a shot. And I found that a deer grunt with your voice works just as well as trying to blow a nervous cow call at him when you're all keyed up. But if you're out there chiming in when that guide is calling, especially if things like you say on opening morning aren't going so well and all of a sudden you start chiming in with your calls, it, you're conveying to that guide that, hey, I don't think you sound that good. I think they need to hear me. Um, so I think that's a big mistake. Also, I say follow your guide. When he's moving on an elk, stay behind him. Stay you know, a step and a half, two steps behind him. If he stops, you stop. If he walks, you walk. If you're glassing and your guide starts to walk, stop glassing and follow him. In other words, you need to hunt according to his pace and his instincts, not yours. I don't mean that to sound critical, but that's a, that's a way you start doubting or making your guide think that he's not doing things right. If you're picking your own path, walking out beside him if you're walking out beside him you may not mean this intentionally but he has a harder time picking the path that he's going to walk because he's trying to pick a path for two people now 
and now he's hearing your feet more than he's hearing the elk out there in front of him and it distracts him so i say stay behind him the only time in my opinion and when it's okay to walk out beside him is when you're coming back to the truck and everything is relaxed and you're just visiting and nonchalant about it otherwise staying behind him shows respect and shows that you're acknowledging that he's the leader of the hunt and it allows him to use his hunting instincts and hear better you know i thought of something while you were talking and i think this is good that we go through this because i think we're conveying this in a way of you know guys that have done this for 25 years and have kind of seen it all and neither steve nor i are are one to ever tell stories on our clients uh but you know we've seen it all so I think a big one, Steve, and I know you're going to smile when I say this, is when your guide pulls out his call and his intention is to call and get a response, that is the time for you to stand five to ten steps away and yeah. listen. You're not digging in your pack. You're not crunching pine needles. You're not breaking pine cones. You're not you know, huffing or puffing or sighing. Or, yeah. or, or you are standing almost with your hand cupped at your ear and you are intently, you know that your guide is pulling out either his bugle or his cow call. You know that the guide is trying to get a response. Give that guide a little bit of space. Yep. So he doesn't. Your say- job is to listen. And yep. if, if he calls, your job isn't to say, there it is, and talk. Your job is to point and be like, I heard one over there heard one over there and let the guide listen with his ears as well but that is not the time to be talking it's not the time to be doing anything don't be moving stand perfectly still and listen man you nailed that jay absolutely yeah and you're like you said your body language means so much too um if you're conveying that hey you're 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 in it to win it with the guide and you expect to hear a call back like you say, you're not huffing or putting on kind of that pouty countenance. Um, again, instilling confidence in that guy, no matter how time he may, he may call a hundred times without a response, but it's just that one time that can turn the whole hunt around. So that's what you're hunting for. And that's what you're expecting. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, you nailed it right there. Giving that guy a little bit of space so he doesn't feel, uh, you know, kind of intimidated to blow that call right on top of you. It just makes all the difference. Plus, you can hear better if you're out there, you know, a few yards away from him. Yeah, and I mean, I've just, I've done it so many times where I, you know, go and I'm trying to get a response for the team. And I just about blow the call and all of a sudden they take six or eight, ten steps and clanking around. It's like, no, just get just a little bit of distance not much, a couple steps to four or five steps, stay back just a little bit, let them call. And all your job is to is listen. You hear a cow, you hear a bull, because a lot of times the guide is going to call and midstream in his call, another elk's going to answer and he may not hear it. So your only yeah. job is to say, I heard a cow answer this way, which way, that way. Okay. I heard yeah. a bull over here. I heard two bulls. Right when you called, I heard a bull here. And at the end, I heard a bull here. That's all great feedback. If you're moving around and clanking around and, you know, getting a drink of water, that isn't going to work. <laughs> yeah. Or taking a layer of clothing off. Yeah. Digging in your backpack. You're exactly right, Jay. You could write a book on this topic, actually, I feel like. A, a very good book. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other thing I think is, I, I think I touched on it, you know, if you're archery hunting, um, I think it's important to have, you know, either the guide bring a target or you bring your target and you two as the hunter kind of be off in your area, whether it be your tent or your travel trailer or where, and you prepare yourself, you're not in the middle of camp flinging arrows through, you know, you're off and you're concentrating on what you're doing. And maybe the guide isn't anywhere around you're, you're preparing yourself and not showboating you know you're not shooting a hundred yards through the center of camp and you know trying to be the center of attention you're off preparing for your shot of a lifetime and you know if you need help from the guide or if you know something's up with your bow or you need you know whatever um i I find that important too to you know be prepared yourself for your hunt and for your shot. Let the guide do his thing, 
um, and that always works out well. Oh, yeah, absolutely, Jay. Uh, you know, I've got some people that come to mind, and hey, Chris Scruggs, if you're listening out there, you were that ideal client. You were that guy that instilled confidence in me, even in a year that it was tough. You, I still felt confident hunting with you, um, and things went very well for us, all because of his attitude, because of your attitude, Chris. And I've had a lot of guys like that over the years, but most recently him. Um, and on a super tough year, Jay, it was still a fun hunt to hunt with a guy like that. I know he's a loyal listener of yours. And, uh, yeah, I just always hope for and I'm so happy when I get clients like that because it makes all the difference. <laughs> Attitude is everything. And, yep. and as you know, Steve, a hunt can change like that. Literally yep. in a snap of fingers, the whole context of the hunt, the whole outcome of the hunt can change. And if you just maintain a good attitude, um, it goes a long ways uh, for sure. Uh, question here, tactics for drought conditions other than sitting water. Yeah, I would say for me, what comes to mind is, is glassing and spot and stock, you know, uh, like we've talked about some, you know, look, look for terrain in the unit where you, where it lends itself to that. Obviously, if you have someone who can, who can help you with that and can keep eyes on a bull while you go make a stock, um, I think that's exciting, a, a fun way to hunt if they're not bugling and, uh, it, it kind of beats having to compete at water because I know in some of these units, it's, it's just so competitive at water. And I know that's a good way to kill bulls for a lot of people. I'm, I'm not knocking it. Um, but for a guy who's looking to do something different, I would say, uh, yeah, take that, take that spot and stock approach. Uh, because many times, even if the elk aren't vocal, you can glass up big bulls. And if you've got somebody keeping eyes on them, you can slip in on them, get in tight, and wait for them to make a mistake. Good stuff. Uh, question, have you tried the new aluminum bugle tubes from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls? You know, Jay, I haven't, and I'm, I hate that I haven't. I'm chomping at the bit to try them to see what they sound like. Um, I think they're going to sound great. Um, you know, every everything that I've done with Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls has, has turned out nicely. Um, you know, my heartbreaker uh, has an aluminum barrel and I think it's got phenomenal sound. So I see no reason why these, uh, these bugle tubes would not, uh, I know they're very light, very packable. Um, and I, I think looking at the design of the tube that they're going to have good resonance and good sound quality to them. And yeah, to be honest, I need to reach out to them and have me, have them send them to me. And let me try them out. Steve, you, you have in the last couple of years, um, used, a couple of different bugle mouthpieces have you not or did they change the width of the mouthpiece of yeah the actual bugle what we've done with my rogue bugle tube is we have a lip ring on the on the end of the call on the mouthpiece now i will say you can remove that lip ring if you just prefer a small mouthpiece and some people do but i found that that lip ring with that lip ring on there i still get full three-dimensional resonance out of the call but what that lip ring does is it opens up wider width and it allows my lips to vibrate to make that bull calling cows or lip ball bugle that i love to do with herd bulls um, so i think that lip ring is just a very integral part of that call do you have your actual own bugle that, I mean, it's your bugle tube? Like, is, oh. that, is that yours that, that you kind of designed? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's called the Rogue. Is uh -huh. that what you use all the time? Absolutely, yes. Prior to the Rogue, um, they had a bugle that was called the Threat that I used, and it was fairly similar to my Rogue bugle. Uh, now, like I said, my Rogue has that, that lip ring on it, um, the tube design lends itself to good full resonance. It also has a, what they call a tube tamer on the inside of the tube, so you can't see it. It's inside of the tube. But what it does is it kind of uh, dampens that plasticky sound. So while it still has that big three-dimensional sound, it doesn't have a plasticky sound to it, if you will. Steve, um, do people go to your website to buy calls, um, and can they also buy them from Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls? Yes, absolutely. Um, they can get to my website a couple of different ways. They can put in chapelguideservice.com. Uh, they can put in elkcamptv.com. 
and uh, they can go to the shop uh, in the menu and find any of those elk calls that we're talking about. I've got, got them in packages, so if they're looking for multiple calls, they can order them that way. Um, obviously, Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls carries them as well. Um, they can go to buglingbowl.com and, and get anything they want. They can get my signature calls, or they can uh, you know get others. Rocky Mountain Hunting Calls has a very well-rounded selection of calls, um, so there's a lot of options out there for people on that website. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you have um, the Heartbreaker nearby? Ah, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I know you love to be put on the spot. Um, <laughs> blow for me what you call when you were talking earlier. You were just saying, I'm going to kind of take the temperature. I'm going to just kind of see what's going on. I, you know, I'm just, I'm just going to see what's happening out there. I want to hear kind of what, what that sound would be like. Okay. The only missing element that I don't have is my magic gloves. So I have to know that takes me, okay. you have to, that takes me down a level in confidence. For sure. <laughs> okay. So here we go. Here's kind of how I blow it. I don't know how this is going to come out. So we'll, just we'll try. Um, probably from your microphone, just probably set it, you know, set your phone down and be, you know, two or three, okay. feet, four feet away from it. Okay, you got it. Just kind of something like that, Jay. I think uh, I didn't hit that sweet note on the first one. <laughs> like I said, I uh, was a little nervous on it, but um, yeah, I just kind of a, about a one second call. And, and then just... as you do that, so that's kind of your go-to, just seeing what's going on. Let's say you get a response and let's say it's a bull bugling and he bugles fairly, you know, he's quite a ways off, but he seemed pretty interested at that exact time. Are you going to just kind of beat feet, check the wind, beat feet, and, and, and close the gap? Or are you going to then stand where you're at and kind of, let's say he's out there quite a ways, you know, maybe 400 yards, 500 yards. Are you going to move towards him or are you going to amp up the intensity and see if he'll close that whole gap to you? Uh, I'm going to beat feet. I'm going to, I'm going to stop calling. I got him to respond and I'm going to beat feet and get in there quickly and tight with him. You know, I won't run in there, but I definitely, you know, that's when I pick up my pace and step out and get in there and get tight. And then I, I know I blew that call several times. I don't blow it that many times in a row. When I get in there close to him, typically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to blow one call at him. Okay. And when you blow that one call, so you've, you've closed the distance. He has not bugled again. You don't know if he's coming or going or standing there. You've closed, let's say, from 400 yards, you've closed to 200. Are you going to call at, in his direction or are you going to call away from him? What are you going to, what's your very next call initiating, you know, trying to initiate a response? What's your yeah. gut tell you to do? Usually my gut tells me to call away from him or kind of deflect it off to the side rather than right at him. Um, that's generally how I do it. If I'm trying to, like I say, kind of softly introduce myself to him again as I get closer, I don't want it to come across right in his face or loud. So typically I'm going to kind of turn away from him and, you know, maybe blow it at an, at an angle or directly away from him. Yeah. Okay. And let's say you do that and he sounds even more interested and he's bugling in your direction. And let's say he's 150, 200 yards, but he sounded even more excited than the next. Are you going to move again or are you going to hold your position? Yeah, if I look and I feel like the terrain and vegetation will allow me to get a little closer, usually I'll try to get a little closer, to be honest with you. Um, most people that I hunt with, the one thing they say about my calling is they say, I'm shocked at how close you get to them before you call or when you get one bugling, how tight you try to get to them. Um, before you blow your call a lot. So, you know, maybe it would work the other way as well, potentially. Um, but I just always feel like the closer, the better, the easier you make it for them. Especially since, 
you're, you're typically getting them to come to a call and lose their advantage with the wind because you've got the wind to your advantage. When they come to a call, they no longer have it to their advantage. And I feel like the closer you are and the easier it is for them to get to you without having to you know, walk wrong with the wind for 400 yards, the more apt they are to come in. In other words, if you can get to inside of 100 and make that call, their margin of error is much smaller in the fact that they, they only have to close another 40, 50 yards to where you see them or they're in shot range, but they don't give up a lot by only losing 40 or 50 yards of, of losing the wind. If they lose the wind for four or 500 yards, that puts them in a much more vulnerable state and they're not apt to do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So yeah, play the law of averages and put it in your favor. I, I want to kind of finish on one last thing, and that's kind of a directional. You've got an elk committed to the call and and walk through a situation where the wind and the direction in which you're calling and how you're actually trying to steer that elk that is coming, that you know is coming, um, how do you work that from a calling, uh, not only from being the guide and calling to your hunter, or if you were hunting yourself and you were the caller, talk about steering the bull and what you do. Yeah. Um, so I'm always trying to steer the bull. Obviously if I'm hunting or calling for a client to the upwind side. So I'm throwing the why that direction because it, it, you, if that bull gets downwind or you make it easy for him to get downwind, they're going to take it every time. So if you're sitting there facing a bull, let's say on a clock, that he's at the 12 o'clock position and you're at the six o'clock position. And let's say that the wind is blowing at about, let's say it's blowing at like 10 o'clock position. If you know what I'm saying from behind you, it's going blowing to, from 10 o'clock to say four o'clock you're saying. Yeah. But it's in general going in his direction. If you okay. know what I'm saying, yep. <laughs> he's not directly downwind of you, but right. it's kind of sketchy wind. It's an they, are, angle. they are going to take that wind every time. They're going to test that wind before they come into that call. So if you make it convenient or somewhat convenient for them to do that, they will do it every time and you'll never see them. So I either try to get it directly in my face or, or blowing, you know, more at that, say, 2 o'clock to 8 o'clock angle, if you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. um, to where they can't do that. And many times it takes a lot more patience, a lot more walking around and positioning. You know, obviously I do it as quickly as I can. But I think the worst thing someone can do is get in a rush when it comes to calling and doing it with the wind just somewhat right. Because in general, they're, they're going to get you every time if you do it that way. So, yeah, I'm trying to call a bull past that if I'm calling for myself or a client to that upwind side to where they come by completely unaware of that hunter's presence. And, if, and the first time they, they hear anything from that hunter is his bow going off or him doing a deer grunt to stop the bull. So you are trying to call that elk where he's going to walk by the hunter on the upwind side and, and you're trying to draw the attention of the bull and you're positioning by either the, the using your head at an angle or your hand to direct a call a certain, certain direction to steer him on the upwind side of your hunter, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. And because of that on the upwind side, don't you feel like the, the there's a higher there's a higher probability that even if that bull slides and keeps sliding to catch the wind, it's going to put him right out in front of your hunter? Yeah, exactly. It's still going to give him shooting opportunities. And I found that if you put that wind heavy heavy to your advantage, they're way less likely to try to make a big circle and get around it. I found for me, Jay, most of the elk that I call that way come straight at me. But don't you think they come straight at you because of the short distance as well? They don't have as long, as far to cut the, the wind. In essence, they're going to walk right to you rather than they're a long ways away. And they, it's all the advantage goes in their court. Yeah, absolutely. That's where that distance comes into play and making it easy for them. Yeah, making it easy for them, but you dictating the wind and having control over that aspect. Steve, we've covered a lot of ground today. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate the, the listeners and the Instagram followers um, giving those questions and I um, appreciate you answering them. I want to give you a chance, Steve, uh, several things. If, if there's anything you want to say or anything you think we missed, 
uh, and or the best way for people to reach out to you to follow uh, to watch your show? Yeah, Jay, thank you again for this opportunity. It's been so fun, and I hope that there's something we covered today that will help your listeners on their hunt and to be successful. I, I can't wait to hear about it. Um, yeah, to be able to follow us, uh, if they're Instagram users, uh, we're at Elk Camp TV. Um, if they're Facebook, we are Elk Camp Guide Service and Elk Camp TV. Basically, I should say that I'm uh, transitioning and changing my guide service name to Elk Camp Guide Service just because I feel like it's a better fit. It goes in tune with the show. Um, it, you know, we're elk specific, we're elk specialists, so I just feel like it's a better fit. Plus, my guides don't have to wear hats that say chapel on them. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think that's nice for them. Um, they can look us up online again at chapelguideservice.com. That's with two P's and two L's in chapel. Or again, they can log on to elkcamptv.com. Um, they can uh, search on YouTube for Steve Chapel or Elk Camp TV. They can find me that way on YouTube. And then, of course, uh, watch the show on Sportsman Channel. I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, it's channel 395. If they're a DISH customer, if they're DirecTV, it's channel 605. And it airs Monday evenings at 8 p.m. Eastern time, so they'll want to adjust for their time zone. Um, and I appreciate everyone watching and, and for, for their encouragement. Awesome, man. Well, sounds good, and um, hope you have a great season in Unit 9. And I look forward to... Um, chatting with you after the season and and wish you and your guides uh, all the best of success and hope you have a bang up year and um yeah it's this time of year that we're you know we're always looking forward to going into the season and we're you know about to kick off a new season so everyone's getting excited for sure yeah we definitely have high hopes and anticipation for a better season now that we've, we're getting this rain i'm so encouraged by it and yeah i want to wish all of your listeners great hunts and all the best of luck out there and, and and again jay god bless and thanks for this opportunity to be on with you today all right bubba take care guys i want to thank you for listening to this podcast if you want to send me a direct message you can do so on my instagram account which is at j scott outdoors you can also send me an email at j scott outdoors at gmail.com I appreciate all the feedback on the podcast, and I look forward to hearing from you. GoHunt.com Insider has Filtering 2.0, where you can get draw odds, strategy articles, species and unit breakdowns, and unbelievable gear giveaways. Did you know that they actually have a point system where you get 11% back to the consumer for using points for every dollar spent? Also, new, uh, a new addition is the mapping, Go Hunt Maps. You have the desktop version, you have the mobile version for iOS and for Android users. There's never been a greater value for the Go Hunt Insider. Check them out at gohunt.com forward slash jscott.